Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Coach Baseball Right podcast. I'm your host and founder of Coach Baseball Right, Steve Nicolaret. Join us as we go inside, outside, and all around baseball, discussing how to coach baseball the right way. Hi, everybody. Steve Nicola Rott with Coach Baseball Right. If you are considering how to improve your organization, facility, or league, consider our organizational league facility certifications. These certifications are extremely affordable and you can choose from three different levels. Level one is our most affordable certification that starts with just your administrator getting access to our pro membership resources. And then all of your coaches can be put on the same page by using our rookie membership resources. Level two certification gets all your coaches and your entire organization using our pro membership resources together. Level two will help your coaches teach and develop consistently throughout your program. And level three, everyone in your organization, all administrators, all coaches, all parents, all get on the same page with access to our pro membership. Level three will completely transform your baseball program. Plus, we'll provide year-long follow-up for support, strategies, and ideas to help you and your organization maximize and use these certifications. If you're asking how you can make a difference for your organization, league, or facility, consider these organizational certifications. Hi, everybody. In today's Coach Baseball Right podcast, we're going to visit with Chris Gissel from Baseball Dudes. Chris played professional ball for 14 years and had a short stint with the Rockies in the major leagues in 2004. Today, Chris works with baseball players in the Vancouver, Washington area. He has some really great insight on baseball and most importantly, teaching life skills through baseball. Sit back and enjoy our conversation with Chris Gissel of Baseball Dudes. Hi, everybody. We are here today with Chris Gissel from Baseball Dudes. Chris was a fourth-round draft pick by the Cubs in 1996, played professionally for 14 years for the Cubs, Rockies, and Cardinals, and had a brief stint with the Rockies in uh, 2004. Chris also coached for three years in the LA Angels organization. Chris, thanks so much for being on our Coach Baseball Right podcast. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm looking, looking forward to sharing. Hey, Chris, our Coach Baseball Right program is all about helping organizations and coaches and parents transform baseball experiences and developments. We started the podcast to allow our listeners to hear different perspectives on coaching baseball the right way. So with that being said, let's jump into our first question. Hey, Chris, I know I gave you a, a, just a brief intro here, but can you, uh, can you expand a little bit on your background growing up and, and uh, how you got into baseball and, and maybe your career a little bit? Well, uh, growing up, going, going way back, um, grew up in the Bay of California, played in, um, actually lived in Concord, California and played in a little league there. And, you know, way back then there wasn't, baseball was much different. There was little league and that was about it. So, you know, our seasons lasted maybe 20, 25 games, maybe more than that, a little bit, depending on if you went to all stars or not. Um, and then I played other sports from there, played basketball, really enjoyed playing football, um, we moved up here just before I started high school, so in the early 90s, and went to uh, up here in Vancouver, Washington, went to Hudson's Bay High School, and graduated in 96, and from there, um, as you said, I was fortunate to get get drafted, um, spent the next 14 years. My first six years were with, were with the Cubs and the organization, Cubs organization, made it up to AAA with them, and then kind of bounced around to a few different organizations from there we were we were also very fortunate to play in Japan for a couple of years so my wife and I got to spend um, a couple summers in, in hot Tokyo um, from there also had the opportunity to play in Taiwan for for a few months so it took us a lot of places got to play in Puerto Rico and Mexico also so got to got to experience a lot of it it you know had no idea not going to college that didn't realize that baseball was going to be my kind of education, my life education. And uh, from there, <clears throat> uh, about a year after I was done playing, I uh, was trying to get my way back into it. I uh, was in a interview 
for a scouting position with the Angels. And during that interview process, you know, towards the end of my career, I, I shared that with the guys doing the interview. I shared with them that as a player, towards the end of my career, I had a lot of my teammates were looking to me for advice and whatnot. And within that conversation led, you know, led the question, led to the question if I was, had any interest in player development. And then from there, a couple months after that, the angels hired me and was very fortunate to, to spend three years um, coaching their young minor leaguers. I got to spend two of those years with the guys right out of the draft, which I really enjoyed, really enjoyed that level. It showed me, showed me and taught me a lot about, a little bit what, about what's going on in youth and amateur ball, um, and then what kind of the, what, what some of those holes that were missing. So it was, I really feel that those few years um, coaching was almost preparing me for, for what I do now. And that's that's exactly what I, I kind of want to segue to is would you would you explain to our listeners uh, what are you doing now and and um, and give us a little bit of detail on that. Well, now, now I get to, well, I guess not get to now. It's kind of baseball has been my life ever, ever since I, I graduated high school, um, which is crazy to think, and we're, we're super fortunate for it. But, you know, now I get to spend most of my time with, with families and, and players in their youth years up into their high school years. And I recently started helping out a local junior college. So it's, it's just teaching all the time and, and more and more that I'm learning about it. It's helping these kids learn how to think about it, you know, rather than play it physically, but learn how to, how to play it mentally. It's a huge, and even, even going on down to the lowest of low levels, you know, from coach pit kids to first year kid pitch. And, you know, a lot of these kids are, to be honest, they're scared of the ball. So trying to help them figure out what, what they need to be thinking when they're stepping into the box or getting on, on, on the mound, um, that's a huge part. And we, so much, excuse me, so much of that mental piece, you know, not only how they're performing on the field, but then how do you, how do you carry that, carry that into life off the field and realizing that the game is about as temporary as you can get for most of these kids. Um, if not all of them that we're seeing, you know, at some point the game's going to be done. So how can we, as as coaches, as parents, help prepare them um, with these lessons that the game gives us, help prepare them for what's going to happen when they're done playing? And it's very so, relatable, very, very relatable. So uh, as you know, we've already talked about this before we went on. We're, you know, we have two parts to this. I want to talk a little baseball with you, some specific okay. things for our coaches that want to know some things on pitching or hitting or, or even how to help a kid who has a fear factor, right, getting into the plate. Um, mm-hmm. But a good part of this, we're going to talk about that last part, identifying and seizing those moments where we can help kids grow um, life skills through baseball. But let's just for a second um, talk baseball specific. You had mentioned just a second ago you work with some kids are, that are afraid. What would you tell a, a, a coach who's working with young kids and he's got a maybe a boy who's been hit by a pitch and he's, he's afraid? What would you tell him? Well, first, that, you know, that is the toughest thing to help young players through. You know, we can help them with mechanics and where to stand in the box and where we want their hands to be and the loading and all that. That's, that's kind of the easy part. Um, the toughest part is getting them to believe. You know, the toughest part is, is we, we have to be kind of a salesman a little bit. You know, we have to help them realize that this is what they need to do to be the most prepared, you know, and again, way more than a physical thing is, you know, getting them to imagine themselves that that pitch is going to be right there and they're going to be ready to crush it. You know, just making that as simple, as simple as you can get, um, which to be honest, that's exactly how a lot of, a lot of high level athletes compete too. you know, just, it's going to be there and I'm going to hit it. Um, it, by by far, as I mentioned, it's the toughest piece, and finding some way to make it relatable to them, um, whether it's you know if they like playing another sport, and when they have success in that sport, what's going on in their mind? Um, this is a, you know these kids are driven by video games these days, helping them 
You know, when they when they have a little bit of success in a video game, what was their mind like in that moment? You know, finding some way to relate it to what's going on in their 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 life, not ours, but in their life. Um, the most important piece and the mo- and w- the way that we found to be the most successful at it, but it is tough. It's really tough to coach confidence into young players that are scared of the ball. You know, I was working with a guy, a little boy one day, and, and he was scared. And, and um, he told me that he liked to ride his bike. And mm-hmm. I remember I asked him, I said, hey, have, have you ever fallen off your bike? You know, sc- you know, scraped your knee, got a little blood down there. And he said, yeah. I said, you probably cried a little bit. I said, yeah. I said, what, what, what was the next thing you did? And he says, well, he says, I, I got back on it. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I said, it's, it's yeah. the same thing with baseball. I said, you're going to get hurt a little bit. And yeah. it's okay. Don't be afraid of it. So it's, it's so neat to hear different strategies that guys like you oh, yeah. use um, to help these kids. Um, now, just for a second, I want to talk to you. We're going to go to pitching. And I was reading some of the, the, the information uh, on, on your website. And you were talking about uh, with pitchers, the – the discussion today between when you get now these are high school kids and and maybe advanced travel ball kids and college kids, but the discussion on distance running versus quick short burst training, and mm-hmm. I want mm-hmm. you to give your thoughts to our listeners on on that. Well, th- this is at the higher levels of this game, <clears throat> you know, college and and in pro ball. This is a very very kind of sensitive subject, and I, I remember when I was coaching with the Angels being in being in meetings with the pitching coaches and the strength and conditioning coaches. And there was, there was definitely a back and forth and different view on what was right and what was best for the athletes. Um, you know, I, I came up in a generation where distance running was a part of our between start work, um, preseason work, you know, spring training work it, that distance was, was always a piece of it. And, you know, now I guess there's there's science and everything that is kind of proving that wrong. You know, what it does to the muscles and, um, you know, does it really flush or or not? You know, it's. I know that for me, I personally, again, this is everybody's a little bit different. Um, I enjoy the distance running. I know that one piece that isn't really talked about is is a psychological piece of it that when I would go out on a, on a twenty or thirty minute run the day after a start. It was it was a great time for me to just get into my own head and reflect on how the previous day went. You know, nobody else is with me. I'm in my own thoughts and just really reflecting on how that day went, you know, what I could have done different, what was really working. You know, the visualization during that 20 or 30 minutes was, was on overload. And, you know, next thing you know, that 20 or 30 minutes is up. Um, but I also love sprint work. I mean, I, I would... I would do sprint pulls, which I know some people may say that's too long of a sprint. Um, but every, every day I ran, even on my distance days, there was sprint work involved. So after my 20 or 30 minute run, minute run, very often I come in and I do, you know, eight to 10, 60 yard sprints or, you know, 90 foot sprints, whatever it was. Um, cause I, I enjoyed that too. I, I liked how legs my, made my legs feel, you know, back then we weren't, we weren't, we didn't have the information that, you know, the type of muscles you're developing doing sprint work versus long work um, is different. You know, we didn't have that back then. So I, I don't, you know, there's people saying that it's distance running makes will lead pitchers to arm injuries. I don't know if I really believe that <laughs> um, just, just doing it myself and, and being a part of a generation that we all did it. And you know, there wasn't really many injuries then, but then also we didn't throw as hard as we do these days either. You know, we know so much more about training now, about explosiveness and how to, how to create, um, you know, more explosive players. That is a, is a big reason why we have so much, so many more hard throwers these days. Um, I think it's, it's all relative, but I, I don't know if it necessarily hurts guys to run distance. Do you think uh, the injuries that we have today, it seems like we have more. Well, let me oh, ask yeah. you first, what, why do you think we, we have more injuries today than we did oh, a generation ago? That's, that's a whole conversation on its own. Um, many, many factors. Um, 
velocity at the higher levels velocity is definitely relatable to to injuries i mean the the body i remember as coaching like seeing these guys just coming and throwing so hard and it was almost inevitable every guy that you saw that was a mid to upper 90s guy almost every single one of them at some point came down with an injury and it's there's not very many Nolan Ryans out there, you know, that can throw as hard as they throw and be healthy all the time. Everybody likes to compare to Nolan Ryan, but he, the dude was a freak of nature. You know, it's that God made one Nolan Ryan. You know, we can't expect that everybody else can train and throw as much and to throw as hard as he did and be as, as healthy as he was. You know, I think it's very tough to compare to, to guys like that. Um, but I think how hard guys throw, is lead is is a cause. Um, I think the the at the lower levels, the lack of of work on proper mechanics, but then also velocity training. I think the, there's a, there's a big issue there. You know, if a kid is flying open, but but yanking on his arm as hard as he can to try to throw hard, it, it, it's coming. You know, the injury is going to come at some point. Um, you know, people don't want to hear this, but with what's happening in youth baseball and it's all tournament baseball driven, um, you know, it's just so bad for these kids' arms. They're just not – everything that I'm learning, there's not a very good understanding of the arm, um, what it needs to recover, what it needs to prepare, what it needs to maintain. Um, you know, we see kids all the time that they will not even do anything during the week, you know, and then go and, and – do so many throws over a two day period and then not do anything for really anything for two weeks after that. And then do the exact same thing again. So that like up and down vicious cycle on the arm. It's just, it's just really hard on it. Really hard. Um, again, we could talk for an hour just on that. So I, I wonder, there, I, I'm sorry. I, I was, I was just going to ask you this. I, I wonder if the fact that we can, get the body, the arm to throw at a certain velocity that we can do that. If it's still worth asking it, is it, is it okay to do that? Do you know what I'm saying? Do you know where I'm going with that? Yeah. Um, uh, un- unfortunately, you know, every baseball player wants to be a big leaguer. Every, and especially once, once these kids start getting up to the higher levels, um, high school, college, you know, we see that, man, these kids, we really have a shot at becoming a professional. But what what college and and pro recruiters and scouts are looking for, you know, they all may say something different, but the first thing they're going to notice is what the radar gun says, you know. And that's, to be honest, that's what's driving all of it, you know, is is that that number on the gun equals – a chance or that number on the gun equals a higher dollar sign, you know, when it comes to a draft slot and signing bonus or, or, or college scholarship, whatever it is. Um, and that's just the reality of it. You know, guys aren't, if a scout has two guys that have the same numbers, but one guy throws 95, the other guy throws 90, you know, there's, they're going to have their, their eyes are going to be a little bit bigger for that guy that throws 95. Again, just the reality of it. Um, I don't. I don't think we ever shy away from trying to be our best. I think we need to be very smart about it. I, th- I think there's a lot going on out there that we're just doing something because we saw a video on it, and we don't really know the intricacies needed to to make that happen. And and I wish more of our our scouts, and I wish more of our recruiting was was we went. I mean, everybody needs to look at the lot. I get that, but we also mm-hmm. need to look at at, does a guy know how to pitch? Oh yeah. If, if I had a boy yeah. one day that that he struggled with uh, throwing strikes, and I, you know, I, I asked him. I said, you know, the pattern's pretty much the same. You know, walk walk mm-hmm. three, hit a guy, the umpire misses a pitch, we make an error, and we're down five nothing. Mm-hmm. And and I asked him. I said, hey, what did you do in the summer? And he says, Coach, I moved the gun. I needed to get seen. Mm-hmm. And my my thing I would say to coaches and recruiters is. At some point in time, we all have to pay the price of getting guys out. You know, we have to be able to pitch. And I, I wish that we would put more of an emphasis on looking for guys that could pitch as well as looking yeah. for guys that had that tool. 
Well, pitch, pitch ability. You you ask you ask a lot of coaches, and and they will they will say they need guys to throw strikes. Um, they want guys to throw strikes. Velocity doesn't matter. But a lot of them, when it comes down to it, they're they're putting rotations together based a little bit more heavy on the on the velocity side than the pitch ability side. You know, they're thinking that the high the higher velocity guys have a have a bigger chance of making mistakes and getting away with it, whereas the lower velocity guys don't. And ultimately, most of these programs that do that, by when you get closer to the end of the season and the coaches are feeling that the games count more, you will see those guys with with more pitchability that are that are getting the chances. Um, it, we see it year after year. You know, it's <laughs> it's funny to be on the outside looking in and seeing it happening. I try to write about it and share about it as much as I can, but that you know, many people will only listen when they want to listen and that's that's where we're at hey let's go to hitting for a second um i was reading some of the stuff you were talking about and the use of videos and and, uh focus on your good swings and and you know your suggestion the coaches uh you know hey you don't have to say something on every rep but let's go ahead i'm just going to let you articulate your philosophy on hitting well as far as um first i'm a pitching guy at heart so hitting a lot of a lot of what I've I've teach and I've learned on hitting is based off of being a pitcher and what I look for. You know, some weeks some if I see a hitter doing this, then I know how to attack them this way. You know, if I see a hitter hitter is really good here, um, you know, this is why he's able to be good there. So a lot of what I know from hitting is based off of off of the other angle of it. Um, but to get to get to video real quick. Video is a tremendous tool, you know, and it's something, again, in, in, in my generation, we weren't, we didn't have that. You know, it, it was, shoot, the, the video quality on the TVs was crazy compared to what we get these days. Um, but sometimes we can get so stuck on looking at the bad stuff. You know, what, what am I doing wrong here? You know, and we only want to look at video when things are going bad, whereas, if we if we make a great swing, you know, or we throw a great pitch, you know, one where everything was synced up properly, that's the video that we want to look at more often than not. You know, what did what do we see? What did that feel like? Um, you know, this this is the one that we're trying to repeat, swing after swing, pitch after pitch. So we and we got to be very careful. I remember seeing at the young at the lower level of, of pro ball where. Guys would only, the only time they would ever want to come and look at video was when they had a bad day. You know, whereas, to be honest, it should be, should be the opposite. You know, what, what was I like when things were going good? Um, but as far as philosophy on teaching hitting goes, I'm more of teach athleticism, um, not necessarily robots. I mean, there's some things that we need to do in the swing, you know, that I've learned that, you know, our, our hands can't be drifting. Our elbow can't be can't be dropping while we're still striding. Um, things like that. That where we're going to lose power. You know what causes us to be directional versus versus pulling out too soon. What that front shoulder does. Um, when it comes to me and when anything with with teaching. You know I I tend to more let the kids get comfortable. Let them get up there and work through it. And then where where I need to interject. You know, if, if we're just not, if things aren't clicking and we keep doing the same wrong thing over and over, then I'll interject. I know that for me as a player, many, for a long time ago, if I had a coach that was constantly chirping and had something to say every single rep, it's going to be really hard for me to get into a groove. You know, I would much rather, especially late in my career, I'd much rather that guy sit there and let me, let me work through this. And if, if I need, if I need some help, you know, I'll ask for it. Or if, if I was doing something wrong and just not figured out, I, w- I would expect for that that coach to give me a little a little tip, a little pointer. This is what I'm seeing. Um, obviously, when you're at the younger ages, you need to be a little bit more hands-on. But as kids get older, they have to learn how to feel and process themselves. You know, we can't we can't be out there holding their hand in the game. So when they're working, we can't be holding their hand there either. You know, we have to teach them what to do, right from wrong. Um, but let them become their own their own teacher. Let them become their own coach. Help them become their own coach. And certainly, when they once they get into the game, 
it's not time to to be thinking about your mechanics. It's uh, you know let your instincts take over. Just let it happen yeah. at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and again, I would I would see that where hitters would would come in from a, a bat where they just struck out, and their first thought right to the hitting coach was, "What did you see?" And I'd hear hitting coaches say, "Oh, got to get your foot down sooner." You know, it's like the same thing over and over and over. Whereas I would much rather have, especially older hitters, you know, come in and and tell me what they were feeling instead of constantly looking for answers. And again, they're they're learning. You know, they're still at a place where they're they're trying to figure these things out. But I think the sooner you you start encouraging players to process things themselves, the quicker they become more confident in what they're doing. You know the the one concern I have on the video is is we have a tool and and I you know we certainly don't need to overuse it, but it still seems to me that we have a tool that if I asked most parents or most coaches, hey here's a swing can you break it down they they still would struggle really identifying the common components that all good hitters have. In other words, oh, yeah. they don't really know what they're looking for anyway. We yet we have the tool. Yeah. Oh, I, you know, again, when players and parents rely more on coaches to teach instead of learning it ourselves and being able to teach ourselves, I think that that's where we get stuck. You know, it's kind of like having, having a teacher at school sitting there right next to the student, helping them through every single problem. You know, it's not, it's not going to happen. You know, we have to learn how to problem solve ourselves. We have to learn right from wrong ourselves. And again, in baseball, we're going to talk about it in a minute, you know, when it comes to pitch calling, you know, these players are having their hand held every single time, you know, and it's, it's not life. It's not life. And I think it's, there's many things in this game that you can relate to real life, you know, and helping kids learn how to use their brains within the game is, is a very under talked about, you know, undervalued thing that the game can give us. And and one one takeaway for all of our coaches out there who are listening and all of our dads, I really do believe one of the best things you can do for your kids is when you give them instruction, when you're when you're helping them, is let them take the responsibility on on them being their own best coach. Yeah. You know, they need to be open to everybody around them, but ultimately they are the guys that need to take ownership over their swing and and I think that's a really, really good point that, that you brought up. Um hey let's let's keep going now. Let's uh, let's jump into. Um, uh, you wrote an article um, that was basically covering five ways we are failing uh, to prepare our kids, and mm-hmm. um, I'm just going to kind of throw them out here, and I'm going to let you talk about them. The first one was was kind of pigeonholing our players. You know, you're a shortstop, or you're an outfielder, or you're just a catcher. Go ahead and expand on that for me. Uh, well, young players, you know, all young players. Their their next kind of goal is they all look forward to, to being a high school baseball player, and when these kids go into this high school, you know their high school tryouts as a freshman, often not always, a lot, a lot of some coaches may kind of know who players are, but if a coach asks a player, you know what position they play, the goal should be that that kid can confidently say, not just say it because they think that that's what the coach wants to hear, but confidently say that you know put me anywhere and and I'm good. Um, you know, I, I, I can help the team out wherever you need me. But what we're seeing is, you know, we're, we're so driven to win, especially at these younger ages. Now, don't get me wrong, the game is always played to win. But I think that as a coach, my, my, my goal should be more of to prepare them for the next level versus preparing them for, for right now. Um, you know, and, and a big piece of that is, is we want players to know the game. You know, we want them to know what the field looks like from different angles. We want them to know how to play it from different angles, um, you know, because all the difference, all the different positions have different roles, you know, on, on different plays. And I, again, it takes knowledge on the coach's part to know the role of all the different positions, um, which I don't really think that happens all that often out there. But it also takes um, – some patience and some opportunity for those kids to get to, to learn the game at those positions. You know, it's, we tell kids all the time. I ask 
10 year olds that say, you know, who here is a shortstop and a couple of them raise their hand and who here is a first baseman, who here is a center fielder, who's a catcher. And you get a couple hands pop up each time. And, you know, we try to help the kids think in more of a way when they're younger that they're a baseball player. They're not necessarily the shortstop or, or a catcher, you know, they, that they're a baseball player. So hopefully that will kind of help them understand that the goal is that for they, they are comfortable anywhere. And we want our kids to play multiple positions. Right. And we want them to be able to understand, not just stand out there in right field or center field, but, but we want them to understand what it means to be out there. And one of the things I always, when I, whenever I talk, I, I ask the dads or the, the people at the, the clinic, I say, hey, where, where, does the, where does the right fielder go on a base hit to, to center, like a one-hopper, and, uh, oh and there's a man on second? So where is the right fielder going to go? And, and, and they kind of, what do you mean? You know, the center fielder's going to make the play. And I said, well, what's the next play? I said, after, after the throw, I said, the, the ball can be cut. Where could the ball go? Well, it can go to third base, first base. I said, why don't you have the right fielder move on over behind first base and yeah. be there waiting for the angle from the cut man through the bag. And, and I think the, the bottom line is tell your kids to, even if they, they don't know why at first, go someplace. Yeah. Go someplace, and then we can talk about why they went there and if it was the best place to go. But, but have your kids know something about multiple positions. Hi, everybody. If you are considering how to improve your organization, facility, or league, consider our organizational league facility certifications. These certifications are extremely affordable, and you can choose from three different levels. Level 1 is our most affordable certification that starts with just your administrator getting access to our pro membership resources. And then all of your coaches can be put on the same page by using our rookie membership resources. Level 2 certification gets all your coaches in your entire organization using our pro membership resources together. Level 2 will help your coaches teach and develop consistently throughout your program. And Level 3 everyone in your organization, all administrators, all coaches, all parents, all get on the same page with access to our pro membership. Level three will completely transform your baseball program. Plus, we'll provide year-long follow-up for support, strategies, and ideas to help you and your organization maximize and use these certifications. If you're asking how you can make a difference for your organization, league, or facility, consider these organizational certifications. Now let's jump into calling pitches. I'm, I'm just going to let you go. <laughs> well, um, again, another very, very touchy subject out there. A lot of, a lot of very one-sided opinions. Um, I'm going to go all the way back to the year I was drafted. And my first manager was Sandy Alomar senior. And this was my first introduction into pro ball, my first, not knowing at the time, but my first introduction into what development really meant. And he would have our position guys amongst themselves. He, he, they, we, as a group, you know, they would all talk about it beforehand, you know, when, when to do it, why to do it, how to do it. And he would have them all call their own steals. They would call their own hit and runs. Um, they would, they would put on their own, their own, when are we going to bunt? Um, and then on the, on the pitcher catcher side, you know, we were taught how to play the game, you know, how to, what to look for in hitters, you know, run on second base. We want the hitter to hit the ball to the left side. How do we do that? You know, this was all stuff from day one in pro ball, you know, professional baseball is very different. The, the atmosphere, the, the, the culture is very different from what we see in youth and amateur ball, whereas, it's a lot more laid back. You're given way more opportunity to fail, I think, because at that level, most everybody there really understands how hard the game is and understands that for us to get to that pinnacle, to become a big leaguer, we're going to have to fail so much and that those failures is where we really learn. And we were taught how to do it. It was, it was known that we were going to make mistakes and the patience was pretty much endless and Let's do it. This is how we get better. This is this is where we this is where we went wrong in this in this situation. The next time it comes up, this is what we're going to do different. Um, 
But like I mentioned earlier, pitch calling from the dugout, for me, you're taking the game away from the players. You know, you are <clears> – it's almost like playing fantasy, fantasy fantasy baseball for whoever's calling that pitches. It's like they're out there playing the game themselves when our job should be teaching the kids what to look for, how to play the game, helping helping themselves develop in them that confidence that they're in control of what's going on, not necessarily waiting waiting to be told what to do. The result of that happening is we, again – getting players right out of the draft, right out of college or high school. I mean, we had kids, we had pitchers that had no clue how to play the game. And from that moment, they were instantly behind behind the eight ball. And we had catchers come in that with nobody on base, no outs, they could not stop looking in the dugout waiting to be told what to do. You know, it it was right, you know, for me, that was like, what's going on here? This was kind of my... My, that was my first real taste of like something, something's not right. You know, these kids are getting to this level, but they have not been given the tools to prepare for this level. Um, and, you know, that, I've written on it before. Another, another way that I look at it is that when kids are 16 years old, they're, they're legally and they're given the keys to drive a car. And they're out there driving and they're on the freeway and they're in a car going 60 miles an hour. They have to be... They have to know to be looking in their mirrors to not just stare straight ahead. They need to know where their surroundings are. They need to know to be able to think ahead, you know, read, read the situation and, and what would I do if this happened? You know, we're, that's life and death stuff, right? I mean, it's, right. that's, that's real life stuff that, that we, that kids are forced into. It's, and even from a young age, kids are, when they do homework and everything, you know, they're, they're preparing for these tests. You know, when they do homework, when they do classroom work, they're preparing for these tests. And when they take the test, it's on them. They they have to be able to remember what they've worked on, you know, be able to recall um, strategies. So what what makes baseball any different? And baseball is just a game. <laughs> it's not it's not it's not life and death. Um, but yet as coaches, we feel we need so much control of what's going on and we don't have the patience for it. I hear all the time that they're not ready for it. Um, I hear, I hear other ways of describing players that I won't mention here, but it's, it's like, come on. I mean, it's, we're, we're looking at this way too hard, way too hard. And as a, as a former pitcher, I, I really realized, I really learned that more often than not, it's not the pitch that's thrown. It's it's how it's thrown and where it's thrown that really matters. You know, any pitch, any count, any location, we do what we want to do with it. We have a good chance, even if the hitter knows it's coming. Um, but we we love the second guess pitch selection when the first thing that we always should be doing is looking at where it was thrown and how it was thrown. Why? Well, great, great point. Great point. Mm-hmm. Hey, let's go to undeserved playing time. Hmm. Undeserved playing time, you know, um, trying to remember it back to when I, when I wrote that article and how I described it after that. Undeserved playing time for me is, is usually the stuff where, you know, players are committed to multiple teams at the same time. You know, we, we refer to that as, as too many commitments, too many obligations um, as far as multiple teams goes. And kids don't show for practice, but yet – they come to these games and, you know, they're being put at shortstop and batting, you know, in the three hole. Um, you know, that's just, that's just one example. Um, you know, players, players with bad attitudes still being allowed to go out there and play while kids with that are the, are the best teammates and, and they're for everybody, but don't have the most talent. They're not, they're not given the same opportunities. Um, in those players that, that were awarding, pretty much awarding and giving playing opportunity, playing time and opportunity to that aren't deserving of it um, because of their, because of their actions and choices. You know, we love to use that word entitlement. Um, but right then and there we are, we are instilling it, you know, the same, the same coaches and leaders and parents that complain about entitlement and players um, more often than not, they're, they're the same ones that are instilling it unknowingly. Um, which is, we all know it's, shoot, it's talked about all the time. 
entitlements talked about all the time, but our choices that we're making out there, I, again, being on the outside looking in and having my own kids, a lot of, of what we do as adults, we are 100% allowing it and making them that way. Yeah, and I think what we want to try to do, one of our things with Coach Baseball, right, we wanted to try to, to help coaches and parents mm-hmm. really think about some of these things and, and think oh, yeah. about the opportunities you have to teach kids these life lessons through sport. You know, yeah. uh, you know the, the coach that has a big game coming up and the kids have been caught doing something they shouldn't be doing, but it's a big game, so we won't punish them this game. We won't sit them. We'll sit them the next game. I mean, we're that's, making that's the yeah, best time to do good. it. <laughs> yeah. you can you can really drive home a point with the kid yeah. that he's not above the expectations because he's one of the better players. So, yeah. uh, really great stuff. Yeah. I really enjoyed reading reading your your opinions on these. And here's the last one that you you mentioned: uh, ignoring defensive fundamentals. Um, you, your your theory, and, and I agree wholeheartedly. The game is based on pitching and defense. Uh, and yet we spend not very much time on on either. Well, what? Let, let me let me put it this way. There's a there's a lot of stuff happening in, in Major League Baseball, and every if you look at all the changes that we're trying to make, we're all trying to make they're all trying to make changes based off of how fast the game goes, and trying to do things to make the game better for hitting. Um, especially because pitching is getting so dominant. So all the changes that are being made are more of, you know, offensive. They're offensive related. Um, so because of that, I mean, we see at the lower levels, people pay to go to games based off of, you know, usually who's in the batting lineup. You know, very, very rarely do they care who's on the mound. Um, but it, it's, I mean, I, I would, I would, love to go to game and watch Mike Trout play. You know, he's, he's my favorite player. I would pay to go to watch him play, not necessarily who's, who's on the mound. Right. That's, and this is coming from a former pitcher. Um, <clears throat> but it, it's, everyone loves to hit. Um, coaches love to teach hitting. There are, a, uh, there are a million hitting coaches out there, but very few pitching and fielding coaches. So hitting is what we, what we all seem to know best. Um, there's, if you look out there and, in the YouTube world and in social media, it's mostly all hitting. There are, there are some pitching accounts, but mostly everything is hitting. So it's what, it's what attracts everybody to the game. And then we see at the youth level too, that that is what's worked on the most. You'll see a lot of teams that there's a lot more focus to detail when hitting is happening versus when pitching and fielding is happening. If it does happen practice, um, that it's usually, we get through it quicker. There's less attention to detail, and sometimes um, not much, not really any coaching to it at all. You know, you'll see guys <clears throat> that will throw bullpens, and there's nobody around because everybody's with everybody taking batting practice. <clears throat> but like, just like you've seen me write about, um, you know, if pitchers can't throw strikes and fielders can't take care of the baseball then it doesn't matter how well we hit, guys will walk around the bases or they will get to run to extra bases because of fielding errors. And that's that makes for a, a long, tough game. Yeah, and, and coaches, if, if we wanted to, if we really want to put our most competitive teams on the field, you know, it's it's about pitching and defense. Um and and that's what I think good coaches will focus on. Now Chris, yeah. one of the the neatest things about your your site, baseballdudes.com, if people go to the blog section and uh, there's a, a section there for parents, there's a note here, um, I guess a letter written. It's called Dear Son. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not going to say anything. I'm gonna, I want you to articulate to our listeners what this is, what this is about, and I'm going to encourage everybody to go to, go to baseballdudes.com go to the blog section and go to the parent specific part of that blog and read it. But can you articulate what, uh, what we have here? Well, um, I'd actually been wanting to write that for, for quite a while now. Um, and I finally found, found some time to sit down and write it. And I actually wrote that just a couple of few weeks ago. And 
I have two boys. Uh, one is 16 right now and the other is 13 and they don't play baseball anymore. Um, you know, they, for various reasons, personal and health reasons, they both stopped playing, uh, within the past few years. But growing up, my dad was always trying to teach me lessons and some of the things that you'll, you see on that, on that note or that message or the article, whatever you want to call it, um, are, are relayed from, from what he taught me. But a lot of them are also stuff that I've learned over the years, um, growing up myself and being a young parent and running a business and being, being a teammate to many and just having to be around a lot of different types of people and people from different cultures and whatnot. Um, you know, it, that letter reading through it, you'll, you'll realize that none of it is talks about baseball. And I think that, that our jobs as parents, um, far outweigh our job as, as baseball coaches, um, as being the parents of athletes. I think that a lot of stuff that, that I wrote in there is, is for them. And, and to be honest, my, that has not been given to my kids yet. My, I'll be adding to it as time goes and I'll, that'll be something that I give to my oldest when he turns 18, which will be in less than two years. Um, and then my, my other boy, when he turns 18, he'll get a, probably an updated version of that too. Um, but in all this, you know, this baseball is a very temporary thing and us preparing them for life, you know, when we are, when we're gone, you know, when they move out of our house, um, when we're not a staple in their everyday lives, the stuff I wrote in there was, it was just, I don't know, coming from the heart and again, hoping to have, they have something that they can refer to, uh, from time to time to help them when they are, are going through life. And, and I just want to again, encourage all of our listeners, you, you know, dads and granddads and coaches and if you want to know why you do what you do with your kids, I think this is this is really gonna this is gonna nail it for you. And, and um, I think it's what what drew me to baseball dads was this, and why I really wanted to do this this interview with you was was this this passage. So I want to I want to thank you for this, and I want to thank uh, yeah. your dad who must have had a big part in helping you create it. So I I think it's awesome. Um, if I if I can switch gears just a little bit for a second, um, biggest concern youth baseball faces today. What do you think? Uh, big, biggest concern, probably a, a few different things. Um, you know, the, the tournament style of baseball really, really instills and creates almost this like sense of urgency, um, this forgetfulness of the process, this lack of a realization of one, these are kids bring differently. Um, they're at different phases in their life. Just because they're the same age doesn't mean that, that their their internal clocks are at the same same time. Um, I really I really feel we, we lose we're lo- we lose and we're losing that sense of reality. You know, we, we put together these superstar teams and they go out there and they actually just wrote about this a little bit today, I think. Um, you know, they go out there and they, they beat everybody. Um, their win loss records are <laughs> crazy. You know, you can go a whole season and only lose a couple games because the kids are just that much, that far superior, um, than their, than their peers. And with that, you know, we're in those type of situations, these, these, and I'm, I'm, I help, I have to help kids understand this. They, they don't know how to fail. You know, they, they're, they don't know how to lose properly. You know, if they go out there and they don't win a tournament, you know, the whole weekend is looked at as a failure. Um, it's like we're playing a world series every weekend. Um, but understanding that the process of development, the process of growth, you know, the process of life. Um, I think because of, of where youth, youth baseball is and youth sports is now, you know, that 
that we're really losing sight on our goals for the next year and where we want them to be in five years and in 10 years of what type of people we're creating and, and what's, what's coming from this. Um, I, th- I think it's, for me, that that's probably the biggest, the biggest issue is we're forgetting what the, what the end goal is. You know, the end goal is not to win every game that we possibly can as, as a youth athlete. It just isn't. Um, I had many years where I was on the worst team in the league and I had some where I was on the best team in the league, but more often than that, you're right there around the middle. And I think if, again, what we see as kids are growing up on in these programs where they are the best of the best all the time, that all of a sudden when they get into a situation where they're one, either their peers have caught up with them or two, all of a sudden now they're on a 500 team that they don't know how to handle it. Um, they don't know how to be a good teammate. They, you know, we kind of, we get all, they get very concerned with themselves. And we see that too, with a lot of the showcase type stuff going on. Players only know how to play for themselves and not necessarily the team. So I think for me with, with, that's probably one of the biggest issues is, is understanding the process of development. Any, any thoughts that you have on the number of games being played today compared to the number of practices? For me at the younger ages, it's, I think it should be around a one-to-one ratio, you know, for every one game, there's a practice. Um, you know, if, if a team is playing two games a week, ideally there, there's two practices a week. Or let me step. Let me step back. If they're playing a doubleheader, it should be one to one, probably a day ratio. You know, if if they have a doubleheader on one day, there should be another day of practices. If they have two doubleheader days, there should be, um, you know, another day of practice for that. As they get older, you know that that ratio can definitely change a little bit. Um, in the in the pro world, it it, it very much changes. Um, I know that the college world has. There's there's many practice only days, so I think that ratio is is very good there. But unfortunately, at the lower levels, we we almost see the opposite of that, especially especially within little league, um, the little league rules, which I really wish that they would take a closer look at. Um, we see sometimes, I know when my kids were involved in little league, that they would replace the practice days with games. And all of a sudden, you're playing four day, four games a week with zero practice time, and it's you know practice is so vital because that's where we get to work on some of the things we're having issues with during the games, you know. So it's making time for that practice time is is huge. It's important. It's way it's way uh, you know not not realize how important it is, and it's just looked past because again, coming from a coaching standpoint the games are more enjoyable and the games, to be honest, are easier. It's a lot easier to write a lineup out than it is to put a practice plan together and then execute that plan. If, uh, if you had one thing you could leave with uh, young parents today, what would it be? Probably to slow down, you know, to slow down and, and be careful of getting caught up in the moment. Um, be careful of, only going off of what your your friends say. I think, you know, in this day and age, there's so many options for the families that they tend well to just go to where where their friends are um, because it's maybe seen as more, more of a social thing, which, you know, again, there, there's, a, there's a time and a place for that, for sure. Um, but if, if you're listening to the, the family of the superstar player that, gets to play all the time and the coaches never really have an issue with them. And, you know, that, that coach has a focus on winning and wants only the best players. And, and at 10 years old, only the best players on the team are going to be the ones who get the opportunity. And your player doesn't have to be one of those best that you're going to find yourself in a situation where you're probably nobody is happy, you know, and you're, you're very, very sensitive issue with, kids losing losing love for the game because of the the situation that the parents put them in i just think all of it just slow down just slow down and enjoy it and don't make it bigger than what it is i mean this is my favorite thing is seeing is very fortunate i get to work with 
with some families that have fathers who played at a very high level. I mean, from minor leaguers to big leaguers. And I get to work with their kids and, and, you know, the parents understand that these kids will listen to a different voice um, better than what they, how they listen to theirs. And unfortunately that's how most of us parents feel about it, unfortunately. That's right. um, Or what we're seeing. And I really enjoy those, the parents that have, that understand that and that they just, it is what it is. And they're, you know, encouraging and understand that the relationship that they have with their kids is far more important than what's happening out there on the field. Um, you know, and it's, man, that relationship we have with our kids is, has to be our priority, not necessarily, not how good of an athlete they are. Um, cause like I, I'm sure you've read it, you know, me, right. It's, this is all so temporary, you know, us getting to watch them play is a very temporary part. We have to figure out as, as adults, we have to figure out how to enjoy that. Even when they have bad days, we have to, have to figure out how to enjoy it. And when they come home, you know, how, how, how do we support them with what they're going through to make sure that they are still enjoying it and excited to go out there the next day? Hey, Chris, thanks for uh, really some great advice. I really enjoyed our conversation. I, I, wish, uh, I wish more kids would, uh, would have the opportunity to play for you, and, and uh, I just want to say thanks again for your time. We really appreciate it. Well, thanks for, thanks for your opportunity and asking, asking for, for me to share. I appreciate it. After doing the podcast with Chris, I really wish everybody could play for a coach like Chris Gissel. Not only is he extremely knowledgeable with his baseball, but he understands how much an athlete can develop character and leadership traits through the successes and failures of an athletic experience. In our interview, we talked about different ways we are currently failing to prepare our kids. Specifically, Chris talked about pigeonholing them through one position. In other words, all too often young players play only one position of the game. And in fact, what really should happen is our kids, specifically our best athletes, should be playing multiple positions. So when they get to the next level, they're prepared to play where the coach needs them, instead of just just playing one position. We also talked about calling pitches. It's really important that we let our pitchers and catchers call the game instead of coaches taking that responsibility away from them. We talked a little bit about undeserved playing time. You know, we've got that kid that doesn't really commit to our team, but he's a really, really good player, and when he shows up, he plays. And ultimately, what that leads to is a sense of entitlement, sometimes even uncoachable attitudes. We also talked about ignoring defensive fundamentals. You know, it's it's sort of easy to go out there and get great players, the ones that are bigger and stronger than everybody else, and the pitchers that throw harder, but we don't teach the kids the defensive fundamentals of the game. We simply skate by because we have better athletes than other teams do. So teaching defensive fundamentals, not only, not only how to do bunt defenses and run downs and first and thirds, but how to do the proper fundamentals to make the routine plays. Chris also mentioned um, maybe the biggest concern facing youth baseball is driven by our current tournament structure. Too many games jammed into a small two-day window um, to focus on simply winning another piece of hardware. So I think we need to be careful of that. And I want everybody to make sure they look at Chris's dear son letter. This is something Chris will give to his two boys at the right age, and basically it's it's a roadmap for being a good person, making good decisions, and treating people with respect. I think it's outstanding. And I'm going to provide a link to that letter so that all you guys can take a look at it. Well, hey, once again, thanks so much for listening, and please remember to share our podcast on Facebook and Twitter.